Okay, hello everybody. Can you hear me very well? Yes. Okay, good. Um, we started the LaRouche movement in 1966, and this was, oh, there's yeah, I'm just Pascal. Wondering. Yes. Uh, and this was uh, uh, a little more than two years after the murder of John Kennedy, when the bankers were changing America's philosophy and uh, giving us a mess that we determined to uh, fix by taking the world away from them. That was the purpose of our founding the organization then. Today I'd like to uh, go back historically uh, to what I would call the Lincoln legacy and uh, situate the heritage that we have from Franklin Roosevelt and John Kennedy in uh, 19th century roots. Uh, both uh, Franklin Roosevelt and John Kennedy had the idea of a world alliance of sovereign nations. Uh, that, that alliance was actually in effect uh, with Franklin Roosevelt, with Russia and China. It was an anti-imperial alliance, even though we had we were allied with Britain in the war. Uh, and in this he restored the traditional uh, friendship of the United States with Russia, despite the communists in Russia. Uh, Kennedy had a similar outlook, restored the whole program and more of Franklin Roosevelt, but of course was only in office for uh, less than uh, three years. Uh, so I want to go back to the time after the American Civil War. Uh, this, is a, this will not refer directly to Canada, uh, but you know some things about Canadian history which you should be able to relate to this uh, strategy briefing about that time and the time from then uh, up into the 20th and now 21st century as I go through uh, some stories. I'm just basically I'm going to tell you some stories about what happened in the world, a world that would look very different uh, from what you might pick up in any textbook, you'd have to go to primary sources and 19th century books and other uh, records. Uh, at the end of the Civil War, uh, at, at, upon the death of Lincoln, his policies continued despite a, a being succeeded immediately by a bad president, uh, Andrew Johnson. And this was a program to build up the power of the United States and implicitly all other countries. Uh, I would put this, just you can sum this up in, in terms of very high protective tariffs, subsidies for railroads, uh, the development of power agriculture and cheap coal for steel. It came, both of those things came from building up the railroads. Free schools, free colleges, free farmland, free expertise in science through the agriculture department he created, uh, subsidized mining, especially out west, protected chemical industries creating fertilizer and so forth. This created a popular majority behind the government because it was in everybody's interest, and tremendous productivity. Uh, there was no backing from Wall Street for the U.S. government during the Civil War, and the finances of the Lincoln period that continued uh, right after the Civil War came from the, the issue of both greenbacks, currency, and sale of U.S. bonds by, uh, under the leadership of Jay Cook, a banker in 
Philadelphia, who was uh, tied to the nationalist faction that backed Lincoln. From uh, just to give you a, a shape of what was what what happened in this period after the Civil War, from from 1860 when Lincoln was elected to 1890, the United States increased its coal output more than a thousand percent. Its pig iron, that is raw iron by more than 1,100%. The first American steel mills were built. They'd never been permitted, really, because of the uh, input of British cheap steel before Lincoln's tariffs. Uh, They increased their production between 1870 and 1890 by 6,000%. U.S. railroads grew from 30,000 miles in 1860 to 166,000 miles in 1890. And these are all uh, federal projects, with the exception of one line up in the Pacific Northwest. So the United States industrial power in this period went past Britain and helped to pull Germany also past Britain. So Britain fell in this period to third place and was about to fall behind both Japan and Russia if things continued as they were. Uh, so here's, here's a few of the inside dynamics of this period. I don't uh, expect you to remember the names. You can look these things up. I can refer you later on to some articles that I've written and things that we have on this, but try to get a sense of the fun that people were having in this period, right after the Civil War. Uh, In 1871, that's uh, six years after the end of the war, you had a partner, a group of partners in Philadelphia, Thomas Scott, Andrew Carnegie, uh, William Palmer. They controlled the Union Pacific Railroad that had been built by the government, uh, was completed a couple of years earlier. They were building the first bridges over the Mississippi River. Uh, they, they subsidized the building, creating of a new company called Westinghouse that made air brakes. That means that they didn't have to have a, a, a guy running along the top of a train to screw down the brakes on each train. The engineer at the front could just pull a lever and that applied brakes uh, hydraulically throughout the length of a train so they could double and triple the trains. Uh, And they were starting to build a new second transcontinental uh, railroad called the Northern Pacific, which instead of going to San Francisco was going out to Seattle. It had been chartered, that was the second one chartered by Congress under Lincoln's program. It went from Duluth, Minnesota on Lake Superior out to Puget Sound. One of these partners in Philadelphia, these are the guys backing the nationalist program. One of the partners, William Palmer, built a line out to Colorado called the Denver and Rio Grande. He started to develop Colorado as a second Pittsburgh and move people out there to industrialize and build farms and cities. Uh, And his plan was to build then a railroad from Denver to Mexico City and have a joint development of the two sister republics, the USA and Mexico, for their mutual benefit. At the same time, this fellow, William Palmer, uh, in 1871, created a new telegraph company called the Automatic Telegraph Company. He sent his railroad assistant, Edward Johnson, to New York, and they hired a 24-year-old young inventor named Thomas Edison in his first pure inventing job. Uh, this this telegraph company was to compete with the Wall Street uh, Western Union. Uh, so in in 1872, 
when they're flying high, they're, everything is going to uh, massive new industrial uh, uh, production. Japanese, uh, a Japanese group came to Philadelphia, led by the prince, Iwakura, just a few years uh, earlier, in, in three years earlier, they had overthrown the old feudal government. This was led in Japan by students of Henry Carey and friends of the United States. And they set up the, uh, under, uh, the new, uh, under the emperor, instead of warlords, the emperor was to be more or less a figurehead and they would have a modern government. So this group from, Phil from Japan came to Philadelphia and met with Jay Cook, the banker of these industrialists. Uh, they they uh, prepared a treaty with the United States and a loan of $15 million for Japanese development. He was, Cook was, was negotiating with Japan for Asian connections with the railroads. Uh, and it's particularly with the Northern Pacific Railroad System, which would be a, a part of a global belt of railways, canals, and shipping operations to increase the productive potential of many nations, particularly Russia. Um, he was also um, quietly uh, promoting or negotiating with people in Canada agreements uh, aiming at the United States annexation of the western half of British Canada. The railroad that was being developed, the Northern Pacific, was aided in part by investment from Germany. The, Brit the German ambassador, uh, Baron von Gerolt, G-E-R-O-L-T, representing Bismarck, was putting some money in there. And the new town set up that year on the railroad was called Bismarck. It's the capital of uh, North Dakota. And that was in honor of the German chancellor at that time. Even though Germany was still under a British free trade policy, they were very friendly to the United States, and they were beginning to look into what the USA was doing as the model for their development. So in that year, 1872, a new banking operation was set up by the enemy in Philadelphia. Actually, it had been set up in the, the previous year, 1871. The British... A uh, banking firm of Junius Morgan sent his son, J. Pierpont Morgan, to Philadelphia to be the junior partner in a new firm called Drexel Morgan. The purpose of this firm was to try to destroy the American nationalist faction that was building up the United States of America. And they began to circulate slanders in a Philadelphia newspaper that they controlled and in the London Times, doing that in tandem. They said that Jay Cook's banking house was bankrupt, that he had overextended his investments in the railroads, and that you better get your money out of this. And they pushed this Harder and harder, they issued uh, pamphlets. They issued every. They did everything to try to uh, do this dirt. And in 1873, Cook was forced to close his doors and went bankrupt. This caused a breakdown in the uh, finances of the country. There was the stock market closed for a week. Massive unemployment hit, and the political and financial center of the country, Philadelphia, was fatally weakened. J.P. Morgan, backed by his father in 
London, moved up to New York, and established what came to be known as the American end of the House of Morgan. And Wall Street from that time on became more and more powerful. This, however, did not stop, at least then, the continued drive by the nationalists to build up the power of the United States and to reach out to other countries to build up the industrialization of friendly nations that could out, uh, you know, go over, overcome and overwhelm the empire. Uh, in 1876, three years after this terrible bankruptcy, and, the, and it's, still a de- it's still a depression, the Nationalists held a centennial celebration in Philadelphia. Uh, this was, um, it was sponsored by Henry Carey's friends, and there, there, there was a new pamphlet that Henry Carey had published uh, just in March of that year. It was called, it was, this is probably the most important single pamphlet ever produced. It was called Commerce, Christianity, and Civilization. I'm going to hold this up here. You can see it. A Xerox of the front page, a photocopy of this pamphlet. Commerce, Civilization, Christianity, and Civilization versus British Free Trade. Letters in Reply to the London Times by Henry C. Carey. The the real... um, sharp point of this pamphlet was to attack the opium trafficking done by Britain with the approval of the Church of England and the Queen of England and to the disgrace of Christianity and the West. Of course, as he knew and as we should understand, the British Empire is not Western. It's anti-Western. And that's the right way to look at this, because they brought into the West an attack on every aspect of Western Renaissance and Augustan civilization. So this circulated at the centennial. All the nations of the world, including the British, sent representatives to Philadelphia for this centennial of the American independence, where we put on display the machines and other progress that we had made and invited other people to do the same. Um, One of the people who came there was Dmitry Mendeleev, who was sent to Philadelphia by the Tsar, Alexander II, an ally of the USA. He had just a few years previously developed his periodic table of the elements His mission in Philadelphia was to meet with these industrialists and to investigate a new industry that the Americans had just invented called petroleum. It had been invented in Pennsylvania by the nationalists. And as a result of Mendeleev's investigations for the Tsar, he found out and communicated back to Russia that there was a problem in this industry that although the nationalists and patriots had first developed this as a chemical breakthrough, the industry was was under the control of a monopolist named John D. Rockefeller, and Russia should try to avoid this problem in developing their own petroleum. Uh, Just uh, a few weeks before the centennial opened, the group of uh, friends of Henry Carey, uh, Palmer and others, set up a new place of business for the young Thomas Edison in uh, Menlo Park, New Jersey, which was to be a whole invention factory. And they backed his work, the first uh, production of which was to invent the phonograph for the first recording of sound. 
they sent him to Philadelphia, to Washington to put on a performance of this phonograph where the phonograph gave a press conference uh, for people from Congress in the home of James Blaine's uh, family. Uh, he was a nationalist leader at that time. They made him famous. Uh, and uh, a little bit later in 1880, one of the the uh, the uh, the head of research for the Franklin Institute in Philadelphia, a guy named George Barker, scientist, took Edison out on the Union Pacific Railroad for an astronomical trip to the West to look at the stars and use Edison's new invention called a tazimeter, which measures the light from stars. And while they were on this trip. The scientist Barker uh, gave Edison a tutorial on the history of lighting and electricity, going back to Franklin and to European uh, scientists, and made, began making suggestions to Edison that he, should, he could do better than anyone else that currently working on those problems. By 18... Uh, uh, you know, within within a few uh, months, Edison held a press conference and says, I, I have invented the electric light. He hadn't yet perfected it. And I intend to light up the world and provide electricity for the world. Uh, in response to this, Morgan and Rothschild representatives from Europe came down to Edison's workplace and were frantic to try to get control of this and stop it from being developed. And subsequently, they did get control of Edison's company, but never allowed them to develop uh, public electricity. They had to go have a revolt against Wall Street control and get municipalities to set up uh, utilities. No electricity was ever produced or any other industry created by Wall Street. They're strictly parasitical. They have never done any industrial development anywhere in the world. Um, one of Ed Edison's partners in uh, Europe, a guy named who became a partner of Edison, was named Emil Raffinel, came from Germany to the Centennial, he met Edison's representatives again in 1880 uh, in Paris or 81. They had a they had a, uh, uh, a an exhibition there in Paris, and he became a partner of the Edison interest, took the patents, and began developing the German utility AEG, and spread electricity in Germany and also into Russia. His son was Walter Rathenau, the famous uh, foreign minister of Germany in the 1920s who had the alliance with, with Russia in that period for development. In, in the period right after this centennial, uh, the, the, the Cary Circle in Philadelphia uh, began to to act, in, you know, to in a, with great haste. Henry Carey was very old, and they were under conditions of weakness financially and politically, with respect to this growing power of Wall Street backed by the British. Uh, they set up a secret organization in Philadelphia called the Clan Nagel. C-L-A-N-N-A-G-A-E-L for the purpose of revolution in Ireland. And uh, they had a skirmishing fund to provide weapons for the Irish, including the building of a, an experimental submarine. Uh, one of the leaders of this group was a man named uh, Terence Powderly, the founder of the Knights of Labor, a pro-nationalist labor group at that time, which was the largest labor union in the country, 
and which wasn't so much interested in strikes as it was in teaching workers, uh, uh, including unemployed people, black people, and women, about national economy. Uh, this uh, international uh, Irish organization had as one of its members Arthur Griffith, who later, and also uh, the young man later on, Michael Collins, and in 1922, the two of them led the finally successful Irish Revolution that set up the Irish Free State. Both the, that Griffith was a was a follower of the Carey family. Uh, in 1880, the leader of the Carey Circle, Carey had just died, a man named uh, Wharton Barker picked a candidate for president, James Garfield. And uh, he went to Russia quickly, as soon as Garfield was nominated for president by the Republicans, to try to get going on a full-scale U.S. military alliance with Russia that was supposed to coincide with an uprising in Ireland. Two years earlier, the United States had been building warships for Russia in 1878 in the harbor in Philadelphia, in the shipyard there. So Garfield was elected president. Nine days after he was elected, the Tsar was murdered, was blown up by a bomb in Russia. And four months later, the U.S. president was assassinated. Garfield. Over the course of the next couple of decades, the United States still persisted in its development. And it was not until um, the murder of another president, William McKinley, that a full-scale Wall Street-controlled and British-allied government took over under Theodore Roosevelt. There was one other thing in the family, in the Roosevelt family, that happened in, in the 1870s that I want to tell you about. That nobody knows about today, and I have just begun to re-inquire into. And that was that the Philadelphia the, uh, interests that I've been talking about, these, these nationalist railroad guys allied to uh, Kerry, set up a company called the Southern Railway a holding company, Southern Railway, I forget the third name of it. And this was a company that was in the south of the USA after the Civil War, building connections between the small Southern Railways to hook up the south to the north and the west and to try to industrialize the south and transform it and take it away from the backwardness that it had never escaped from because Reconstruction after the Civil War had not been successful. Thomas Scott, the president of the Pennsylvania Railroad, put into control of this Southern Railroad building operation a man named James Roosevelt, Eight years after, this is in 1872, eight years after this, James Roosevelt's son, Franklin D. Roosevelt, would be born. While they're building this line in the South to try to transform the South, some of the workers on that line were freed black slaves. And they were attacked by the Ku Klux Klan and in many other ways, in the newspapers, in the Congress, and every other way. 
If you look up this enterprise, you'll see that it is the subject of tremendous slander and attack to the present day. And it collapsed the year after it was set up in 1873, it went down with the whole bankruptcy in Philadelphia on, under the Morgan attack and was never really revived. It was only in the 20th century when Franklin Roosevelt, the son of this guy, James Roosevelt, became president. In 1932, he was elected. He began to implement that, this same program for developing the South by building dams on the Tennessee River that ex, that's in the states of Tennessee and Alabama predominantly to build up the potential for industry and agriculture in the U.S. South that had been so backward. This policy of nation building by Franklin Roosevelt attracted the immediate attention of nations throughout the world, Brazil changed its constitution in the 1930s to reflect what Roosevelt was doing in the Tennessee Valley Authority. And over the next years, the United States developed a powerful friendship with Brazil and on into the years of World War II, the U.S. government provided credits to Brazil to build up its first steel industry. It's the only country that we really could do that with during World War II because although Brazil had troops in World War II fighting in Europe against Hitler, there was no, obviously no war in South America. So it wasn't, it wasn't, uh, you know, the war conditions that prevented development. But, but Roosevelt's policy for the end of the war, I would urge you to, uh, uh, to look at uh, some of the things that I've written recently and that we've, we've published in EIR that go into Roosevelt's policies in Iran uh, and other countries. Uh, for after the war. We know more about this now than just Elliot Roosevelt's book about his father. Uh, that there was a world alliance, and that alliance was interrupted after Roosevelt's death by the takeover of U.S. affairs under Harry Truman when uh, Winston Churchill and his friends in the United States, traitors to the country like Averill Harriman and the Dulles brothers and Dean Acheson gave the British and their Wall Street partners control over the government in order to block U.S. influence throughout the world. The whole history of the Cold War is precisely the opposite of U.S. influence, except for, say, the Marshall Plan, which had certain aspects of U.S. benefit, but otherwise the, the whole policy of the Dulles brothers and of, and of Truman was to eliminate U.S. influence in the world. What is the U.S.? What is its influence? It's the republic that's building up man's powers over nature. If it has any other goal, the U.S. doesn't exist. It's simply uh, going out of business as the constitutional republic that was set up. And you see, I, I just wrote a new article on this subject that'll be in EIR in the next issue in, in the form of a book review about the Dulles brothers, John Foster Dulles and Alan Dulles, who were Secretary of State and um, head of the CIA under uh, Dwight Eisenhower. Both of them had been brought into the government by Truman, even though they were Republicans. So this is a terrible period of the 1950s. John Kennedy in the United States Congress and Senate attacked this policy by both Democrats and Republicans of giving up the U.S. Uh, independent policy and saying, we're going back to Roosevelt and we're going to ally ourselves with the nations of the world. We're going to, if you look at Kennedy's inaugural address, it's the Lincoln legacy 
and it's, re, it's restoring FDR's program full force. He says we're going to have a grand and global alliance. The name Grand Alliance was about World War II. That was our grand alliance in World War II against fascism. So we're restoring this, and we're going to dump the specific alliance with the British. Uh, one of the most outstanding uh, examples of this new U.S. policy was in Africa, where Kennedy had a strong friendship and alliance with the president of Ghana, Kwame Nkrumah, the founder of African nationalism, who had been in the United States under Franklin Roosevelt's administration for 10 years, was, was terribly impressed by the TVA, and he made a commitment to build a great dam in West Africa. When he became prime minister and then president and, and got the British control out of Ghana, Kennedy, as president, worked with him to build uh, and finance the dam on the, uh, on the Volta River that, to this day, is, is the great uh, electri electri electricity source for West Africa. The plan was to industrialize Africa. Uh, there were assassinations and betrayals, that one of which was the assassination of John Kennedy himself by the continued gang of the British and their Wall Street friends, led by the Dulles brothers and their operatives. Uh, so that this policy was then overturned. The U.S. Uh, lost these alliances and now engages with the British in the most bizarre, suicidal, anti-national programs. For example, you have the National Security Agency, supposedly a U.S. agency, working in alliance with one other group, the GCHQ of England, and they spy on the United States and other countries. What's that about? How is it possible that we have an alliance with one country against ourselves and against the world? That's, that's, that's that history. It is completely uh, incomprehensible unless you go back to this American nationalism, what you might call 19th century nationalism, which we had in the, for the most part uh, until uh, 1830 with Andrew Jackson. It was interrupted by slave owner control of government for 30 years. And then we had it for another more than generation from Lincoln on. It was interrupted from about 1900 until Franklin Roosevelt. But that is the policy of the United States, that nationalism. And that's what, in, in, in conjunction with, in particular, three amazing nations that came up in alliance with the United States, altogether made modern times on this planet. Those other three nations were Russia, Germany, and Japan. All of them turned against the United States by the British and Wall Street, so that we had Germany, Japan, and Russia as enemies instead of friends in the periods of the 20th century. A bizarre and insane turn of events, since we were the ones that got them going as modern nations. So let me, let me leave it at that. And let's open up a, a, a discussion here, and, and maybe you can put on your thinking caps and see how what I've presented here corresponds to or contradicts what you know or what you think about history. Yes, hi. So, uh, might just be a detail, but you mentioned at the beginning that we should try to uh, try to see what are the relationship between what you just spoke about and, and Canada. 
And I remember, uh, I think it's something that Matt brought up in his magazine, but he mentioned that uh, there was an attempt to, uh, uh, to annex western part of Canada to the United States. And you also mentioned all these, these, uh, these uh, railroad projects you know, trying to connect the, the whole of the, the western part of the United States. Uh, you know, I think Matt brought up the fact that the Canadian Railroad was developed similarly around that time to actually make sure there would be no uh, annexation of the western part of Canada to the U.S. Can you elaborate on that? Do you know a few things about that? I think the most important thing to consider is not the specific plots or plans for a formal annexation, because that's not really the issue. I would say one thing to look at is that in the, eight, in the late 1870s, Canada, like Australia and many other countries, adopted a protective industrial policy. Regardless of who, you know, was trying to do what, this was more or less inevitable at that time because unless Canada developed its own industry, it would lose its people. They'd just go across the border to the United States or else they would be revolting against the British Empire, one or the other. So the real issue is this policy of having the powers that govern society promoting industrialization, the increase of the powers of the people to produce both in industry and agriculture. And this had a remarkable development in Canada as well as in the United States in the later 19th century and, and, and in every other country as well. There were certain uh, um, bizarre sort of uh, holdbacks or freezes on this development. For example, England did not develop elect public electricity until really the end of the century, even though they had inventors who made electric lights and small dynamos and so forth. Uh, but uh, this policy of industrial progress and uh, the necessity, the inevitable necessity of protection for industry and promotion by public authorities of industrial progress and change for more power, more energy flux density, that was obviously the policy of Isaac Buchanan in the 1860s. And it was something that by the 1870s was, um, was totally, totally popular in Canada, as well as in other parts of the British Commonwealth and Empire. Um, as late as the 1920s, uh, if, you go, if you go to about 1920, at the end of World War I, you have a fellow over there in England uh, who was named Lord Lothian, Philip Kerr, K-E-R-R, -R, who was the head of the round table group at that point. And he was, in, 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 right at the end of World War I, he was uh, the one in charge of screwing up the Versailles uh, negotiations. But he issued a little warning to his friends that the problem we have to deal with is that America does not accept the idea of the white man's burden. They don't, they have a different idea that there should be national sovereignty. This is in world, at the end of World War I and included in this warning by Lord Lothian was Canada, that Canada, he included Canada along with the United States in people that, who's, who, who, there, that there's a, 
a popular base of support for the for the idea of actual nationhood in the world that includes obviously nationhood for uh, the peoples in the colonial sector. The fact that Canada had supplied soldiers to be slaughtered and to slaughter other people for the Boer War or for other wars doesn't change that fact. That Canada and the United States share this heritage, this Lincoln heritage. And it's a, it, it's a funny thing. You, you can't look at this in a, in a, just as a straight line, and this is black and this is white, this is this color and this is that color. You have to look at the dynamic of this uh, actual progress that did occur on the ground, that people saw that was their life, the progress of machines, of powerful agriculture, of success in scope and, and in, in quality of work that was shared between the United States and Canada. That's the reality. Um, so there was the growth of engineering in Canada and so forth. Part of this goes back to the period before the Civil War when Canada was the home of part of the Underground Railroad. And yes, abolitionists, to a, to, to a great extent, were guided by British Empire strategists trying to break up the USA. They weren't doing it for good, for good motives. But the people in Canada and the people who shepherded escaped slaves into Canada before the Civil War uh, you know, were, were sympathetic to the actual... Uh, uh, basis for you for the USA, the Declaration of Independence, and so forth. Uh, during the Civil War, people in Canada, by and large, were just like inside of England, were immensely sympathetic to the Union cause, even though the Confederate Secret Service and Confederate government was, to a large extent, based in Canada. Uh, and sent terrorists from Canada over the border into Vermont and Illinois and New York City to try to burn things down, rob banks and free prisoners. Uh, one of the more interesting episodes of that, of course, uh, was the case of John Wilkes Booth, who went to Montreal in 1864. He was in the Confederate Secret Service, working with Judah Benjamin, Confederate Secretary of State who had been born in the British uh, uh, West Indies. And John Wilkes Booth came up to Canada in 1864, met with British and Confederate representatives there, got money from them, apparently thousands of dollars, put that money into an account in the bank in Montreal and came back to the USA with, uh, with his little gang and uh, assassinated Abraham Lincoln. They tried to kill other members of the US government at the same time. Uh, the group in Canada had gotten a $30,000 subsidy sent over from England by James D. Bullock, B-U-L-L-O-C-H, who was the head of the Confederate Secret Service in England. Before he went to England from the U.S. South during the Civil War, he stopped over in Montreal and established the infrastructure up there for spying and and subversion by the Confederates. And then he later on sent this money up to be used by the group that financed uh, and instructed Booth. That's one of the reasons he didn't come back to the United States right after the Civil War, even though Andrew Johnson pardoned all the Confederates. This man, Bullock, was the uncle and mentor of Teddy Roosevelt who was a racist, imperial 
uh, fraud as president of the United States who became president by the murder of his predecessor, McKinley. So this is the Anglo-Confederate apparatus. And, and you have these Dark Ages freaks that from time to time have had their headquarters in Canada, especially in the period when they had the British troops behind them in the, in the 1860s. And then later on, when after Toronto became a great center for, uh, you know, imperial finance, like Wall Street, um, you had Bloomberg up there and other people in, connected to uh, the British Anglo-Dutch monarchy in, involved in the assassination of Kennedy. But this, this question of the annexation of Canada was never the primary issue. It could have been annexation by the willful, you know, by, by the people in Canada deciding that that's what they wanted to do. We could never have taken Canada by force. Uh, and we could have had a Zolverein, that's what, what uh, Buchanan had been talking about, a, 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 you know, a customs union. Uh, but the issue is this industrial development. And of course, the, the, the t tragedy of our time after Kennedy is that Canada, along with the United States, and along with, for example, China under Mao Zedong, gave up, at least China for a time, under the crazy, what was it called, the, the Great Leap Forward or whatever, and, uh, what do they call it? The something revolution. Uh, they gave up industrialization. They gave up this mo this power of man over nature as a, as an ambition. So that's the issue. And the question for the whole world, former colonies or not, in every country, like Mexico or any other country, the central issue is shall the people of each country be allowed to have a massive industrialization and, and the, sci the full set of science powers in each nation to build steel mills and have nuclear plants and have powerful industry and agriculture. That's still the question from the 19th century to the present day. It hasn't been resolved. I'm a very big fan. Uh, your class, the British Empire, wants you to be stupid, which is on the LaRouche uh, support page. Amazing. I send it to everybody. Huh. Um, so I guess this brings us to the point, uh, you know, I could say it in my own words, but I'd like to hear how you'd approach this. What's the solution? Right? You've had all this, you, you spoke about the industrialization and how this really drove this fight to free mankind from the empire. How do we do that again? Right? How do we make it happen today? And how should individuals be thinking about that? From, you know, how, how do they play into that? Let's say, you know, if we're not some big industrialist, you know, like some of the people you described who played a big part, how do we think about that? You know, one of the, one of the things is the green ideology. You know, LaRouche is talking about we need to get rid of the greens. You know, how historically the roots of the green ideology in the United States history. Is. That's kind of two questions. That's two questions. Yeah, let me, let me uh, approach this by <clears throat> saying that, uh, that you, the subject that I've been talking about here, this Lincoln legacy, how many, how many people understand Lincoln as being this great industrial builder? That's not a common image in the mind, is it? Think about that. If you think about John Kennedy and Franklin Roosevelt, are those images associated in your mind with the power of man over nature? The two great inventions, I would say, 
of the 20th century are have yet to be fully unleashed, namely nuclear science and space travel. But that's those are both largely connected with those two presidencies. Um, if you consider what it means to be a big businessman today and then compare that to Edison or some of these industrialists from that period. First of all, you have the financier, the straight financier who lives in Toronto or lives in New York or lives in London or some other place and has a, uh, a it's almost like a, a, a science fiction game going on where they have control of incomprehensible amounts of money and credit that does nothing whatsoever. And it's simply the, the, the result of that money vortex is to take all power and credit out of production, out of, particularly out of the development of production. If you look at a businessman who is not strictly a financier, that is, let's say, the president or CEO of some big corporation, I don't know, think of some big corporations like Microsoft or Coca-Cola or I don't care what. What are they doing to promote the development of industry? You have to try to think this through. There is no such thing as an industrialist today. Is that a successful mode of life? No, it's not. It's, in, it's an impossible mode of life that has come to a dead end. Right now, we are in a failed society, a completely failed society. If you look up at the ceiling in your room or some other place, you'll see electric lights. Why do we have electric lights? Well, we have a power grid and we have inventions that use that electricity to supply light to the room. No thanks to any of the rulers of business or government today. They don't believe in it. But then go back to Edison, go back to Carney, go back to these guys we're talking about, Henry Carey and his friends, and Lincoln. What business were they in? They were in the invention business. They were in the business of friendship with other countries to increase as fast as possible the potential bringing in of new people into civilized work. And by civilized work, I mean work that's well paid, high skill, high paid work that can only happen in a process of continual upgrading of the physical power of man over nature. That's the business. When you don't have that, you have nothing, and you're going to have less than nothing, and you'll have war. So if you read Henry Carey's pamphlet, I, I would urge you to get that and take a look at it, because that's the heart of this successful period. And it's, it, it's something that was imitated in India by a nationalist movement that grew up there, too. Uh, that is, that if you have financiers chasing money and stealing, you have, of necessity, war as more and, more, and mass slaughter as the program. The two things go hand in hand, without fail. When we had um, Lincoln's policies in the United States and 
following the successful end of the Civil War, for a generation we had no war. There were no foreign wars from the United States until Teddy Roosevelt and his friends came along close to the end of the century with this crazy Spanish war and then the line to England for World War I. The same thing with Roosevelt and Kennedy. Roosevelt tried to stop war. Think about this. He's building up industry, getting us out of the Depression. And he sees England and his enemies in Wall Street sponsoring Hitler. And Hitler's running all over Europe, making war. This is before the so-called World War II started. Same thing with Japan. They're backing the militarists in Japan. Roosevelt put pressure on the British. You've got to stop backing Hitler. He gave them a couple of ultimatums on this. And finally, in 1938, uh, they, 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 you know, the public was, was getting pretty mad at this inside of England. But they never actually joined in a fight against Hitler until after the war had started. They never, the, the British were still supporting Hitler until 1940, really when Hitler uh, was marching through France, or through uh, the low countries toward France. Then they got rid of Neville Chamberlain. Roosevelt tried to stop World War II and prevent it. It wasn't successful. But his policy was a peace policy all the way. What do you do with a peace policy when you're compelled to fight a war. Well, the objective in the war is to eliminate the enemy's war-making capabilities and then make friends with them, right? Since you're not for wars. So the U.S. had as a policy to become friends again with Germany and Japan and with the rest of the world, including Russia. Kennedy had the same thing. No war. He took steps, and you read my article on Kennedy versus the Empire in EIR in September. He was moving the United States out of this phony Cold War with Russia. The last thing he was doing was trying to have a rapprochement with Castro. So I'm bringing this up in this way in response to this question. What do we do? How do we get out of this? My own contribution to answering that question is to, is to say you cannot ask people to have a revolution based on ideas that are simply in the air. You have to have some historic basis for it. And to me... Yeah, I, I have in my mind the song, the aria by, or the chorus really, by Verdi that was part of the Italian Risorgimento, the song of the, uh, you know, the Hebrews going back to the lost homeland. For Verdi, that was the lost homeland of, of Italy that he's trying to restore. So we have to look back on this Republican policy, not as simply a, a good idea or as something that existed in somebody's mind, but it's the only successful policy that has actually cr built up and created modern times. Without that policy, and without the leadership image of Lincoln and Franklin Roosevelt and Kennedy and other people that were allied to them and shared their views, but without that image of what we had in the past that gave us modern civilization, you have nothing. You're going nowhere. The present society, the present educational system, the present financial and business leadership, the present intelligence community is a catastrophe. 
so that you know what we did when the, on the anniversary of the Kennedy assassination, and which we're going to be doing some more of in Boston and elsewhere in Texas. That's crucial. Uh, and of course, I would ask our friends in Canada to have the image of Vladimir Putin in your mind, because Putin has done what everybody should do, would namely to call the Americans on why don't you live up to your heritage? What's wrong with you? Why are you acting so insane? Well, it would be better for the world if America came back as an actual country. That's what Putin's doing. And that's everybody's business. It's everybody's business to interfere in the affairs of the United States right now. Because the United States is not acting in its own interests. It's under, it's under policy control by baboons, by crazy people. So if you want to survive, you have to interfere in that. And you have to call back to the Americans and to everyone else when the world had a successful idea, which was this, this Promethean idea. That's how to get out of this. And of course, there are specific measures like strangling Wall Street with, uh, with uh, Glass-Steagall. It's always good to strangle Wall Street. Hello? Yeah, my name is yeah, Mark. Mark. Listen, I wanted Listen, to I want thank, to you, thank first you, first of all, for the most inspiring presentation. And I have two questions. One is, are these guys from City of London morons? Or, you know, you look at England, what is happening right now, this is a country totally disindustrialized. They, they think they can live with the services, financial services? That's the one question. The other is, do you remember Avro Aro project in Canada? That was fantastic airplane interceptor. And the United States asked Canada to scrap it. And completely... We don't have sound because Ilko has turned it down. Huh? Yeah, he stopped trying to talk. Yes. Yeah, because we have an echo. Uh, yes. Did you, did you hear me? What was the name of the airplane? Avro Aro. You remember the best interceptor at the time. And the U.S. asked Canada to scrap it. When was that? Uh, the 50s. 50s, in 50s. But well, we I had mean, real I mean, morons in control of the Dulles yeah, brothers yeah. and Trump. But mm -hmm. the other thing is, uh, <clears throat> you know, are these guys morons in, in the city of London who are actually running... Uh, UK. Listen, you have derivatives which are about one quadrillion dollars mm -hmm. that can never be repaid. You know, the, the financial system is finished. Are they stupid? Or they have some other plans? <clears throat> okay, well, it's obvious that it's the emperor's new clothes situation, right? You, obviously, they're stupid. Obviously, they're morons about who are not qualified to control society. But the, the, uh, the, the real question is, where's the boy or the child to, uh, uh, to, call, to, to call this question? Uh, so one... one um, interesting way of thinking about this and I, 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 would, I would think about it in terms of education itself I, I don't think we have looked as closely at this as we should in the right way how, how do you uh, get uh, some breakouts away from people's uh, fear to speak out about how stupid the rulers of society are how unqualified they are about how uh, 
uh, disastrous this is, but but how how ridiculous it is. It's a joke. It's obviously a joke. It's the biggest joke in, of all times. So, um, if you look at people up to the age of, say, 25 or something, or 20 or 25, I think they just passed a, 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 a bill in the parliament in England to raise the age at which adolescence ends. They raised it up to 25. Did you hear, hear about that? Uh, so you have this younger generation now being kept in a state of uh, uh, barbarism, really, because at least, I don't know if you, if you experience that yourselves up there, but what I notice is that children today, students, younger ones, have no, in general, do not have uh, any regard for other people that are not in their immediate circle. They don't really know much or care much about other countries, the state of the world, or, or possibly even their own country. Um, and this is a very unnatural state of affairs. In former times, wh however mistaken people might have been, they, it, it wasn't that hard to generate tremendous interest in world affairs among younger generations and, as well as older. So if you consider, how, how would you interfere with the educational system now in a way that would cause quick damage and breakdown of this wall of ignorance that walls off the younger generation from their fellow human beings. Why? For example, you know, Africa sends immigrants into North America, into USA and Canada, right? from the wars and so forth. Africa's dying. What do people in our society know about that? Nothing. What do they care about it? Well, I don't think they can care about it if they don't know anything about it. If you, if you ask some, some uh, uh, person, the man in the street, why there is death in a large scale in Africa, they'd say it's because of corrupt dictators, not because of foreign you know, financiers and, and, and their networks causing wars and looting. But it, it, it's, it's, it's very possible to cause a, a freak out, a, a, a hysteria, a clash, a blow up, an interference, an outside, uh, you know, illegal break up of this environment in schools. I don't think that would be that hard to do. I'm not just talking about colleges, I'm talking about high schools. I'm talking about the youth culture as well. You have a spectacularly unsuccessful life now ahead of these children and young adults. So I would recommend that in answer to this question, are the people running our policy morons? It's obvious that they are, that this cannot be successful for anybody's interests. And the, the real question is the emperor's new clothes. Who's going to call them on this? So, so you've you got to look at ways that you're going to break... This is beyond just outreach. 
Okay, hello everybody. Can you hear me very well? Yes. Okay, good. Um, we started the LaRouche movement in 1966, and this was, oh, there's yeah, I'm just Pascal. Yes. Uh, and this was a, a little more than two years after the murder of John Kennedy, when the bankers were changing America's philosophy and uh, giving us a mess that we determined to uh, fix by taking the world away from them. That was the purpose of our founding the organization then. Today I'd like to uh, go back historically uh, to what I would call the Lincoln legacy and uh, situate the heritage that we have from Franklin Roosevelt and John Kennedy in uh, 19th century roots. Uh, both uh, Franklin Roosevelt and John Kennedy had the idea of a world alliance of sovereign nations. Uh, that, that alliance was actually in effect uh, with Franklin Roosevelt, with Russia and China. It was an anti-imperial alliance, even though we, had, we were allied with Britain in the war. Uh, and in this, he restored Lincoln's tariffs. Uh, they increased their production between 1870 and 1890 by 6,000%. U.S. railroads grew from 30,000 miles in 1860 to 166,000 miles in 1890. And these are all uh, federal projects, with the exception of one line up in the North Pacific Northwest. So the United States industrial power in this period went past Britain and helped to pull Germany also passed Britain. So Britain fell in this period to third place and was about to fall behind both Japan and Russia if things continued as they were. Uh, so here's, here's a few of the inside dynamics of this period. I don't uh, expect you to remember the names. You can look these things up I can refer you later on to some articles that I've written and things that we have on this, but try to get a sense of the fun that people were having in this period, right after the Civil War. Uh, in 1871, that's uh, six years after the end of the war, you had a partner, a group of partners in Philadelphia, Thomas Scott, Andrew Carnegie, uh, William Palmer, they controlled the Union Pacific Railroad that had been built by the government. It was completed a couple of years earlier. They were building the first bridges over the Mississippi River. Uh, they, they in, in terms of very high protective tariffs, subsidies for railroads, uh, the development of power agriculture, and cheap coal for steel. It came, both of those things came from building up the railroads. Free schools, free colleges, free farmland, free expertise in science through the agriculture department he created, uh, subsidized mining, especially out west, protected chemical industries creating fertilizer and so forth. This created a popular majority behind the government because it was in everybody's interest and tremendous productivity. Uh, there was no backing from Wall Street for the U.S. government during the Civil War, and the finances of the Lincoln period that continued uh, right after the Civil War came from the, the issue of both greenbacks, currency, and sale of U.S. bonds by... Uh, under the leadership of Jay Cook, a banker in 
Philadelphia, who was uh, tied to the nationalist faction that backed Lincoln. From uh, just to give you a, a shape of what was what what happened in this period after the Civil War, from from 1860 when Lincoln was elected to 1890. The United States increased its coal output more than a thousand percent. Its pig iron, that is raw iron, by more than 1,100 percent. The first American steel mills were built. They'd never been permitted, really, because of the uh, input of British cheap steel before. The traditional uh, friendship of the United States with Russia, despite the communists in Russia, uh, Kennedy had a similar outlook, restored the whole program and more of Franklin Roosevelt, but of course was only in office for uh, less than uh, three years. Uh, so I want to go back to the time after the American Civil War. Uh, this is a this will not refer directly to Canada, uh, but you know some things about Canadian history which you should be able to relate to this uh, strategy briefing about that time and the time from then uh, up into the 20th and now 21st century as I go through uh, some stories. I'm just Basically, I'm going to tell you some stories about what happened in the world, a world that would look very different uh, from what you might pick up in any textbook. You'd have to go to primary sources and 19th century books and other uh, records. Uh, at the end of the Civil War, uh, uh, upon the death of Lincoln, his policies continued despite a, uh, being succeeded immediately by a bad president, uh, Andrew Johnson. And this was a program to build up the power of the United States and implicitly all other countries. Uh, I would put this, just you can sum this up, subsidized the building, creating of a new company called Westinghouse that made air brakes. That means that they didn't have to have a, a, a guy running along the top of a train to screw down the brakes on each train. The engineer at the front could just pull a lever and that applied brakes uh, hydraulically throughout the length of a train so they could double and triple the trains. Uh, and they were starting to build a new second transcontinental uh, railroad called the Northern Pacific, which instead of going to San Francisco, was going out to Seattle. It had been chartered, that was the second one chartered by Congress under Lincoln's program. It went from Duluth, Minnesota on Lake Superior out to Puget Sound. One of these partners in Philadelphia, these are the guys backing the nationalist program. One of the partners, William Palmer, built a line out to Colorado called the Denver and Rio Grande. He started to develop Colorado as a second Pittsburgh and move people out there to industrialize and build farms and cities. Uh, and his plan was to build then a railroad from Denver to Mexico City and have a joint development of the two sister republics, the USA and Mexico, for their mutual benefit. Uh, at the same time, this fellow, William Palmer, uh, in 1871, created a new telegraph company called the Automatic Telegraph Company. He sent his railroad...